Hello everyone. We are pleased to have Kevin, uh, the general manager of Test Pro Project, to share his experience on how to overcome five common obstacles in adopting open source automation. I'm sure all of us can relate to this topic. Uh, we'd like to thank Test Project for sponsoring this session and having Kevin join us today all the way from New York. Uh, just a reminder, uh, to the right of your screen, you'll see a discuss button. Uh, please use the Q&A session while inside it uh, to ask your questions. Uh, without further delay, over to you, Kevin. Thanks, Sahil. Um, first, before we get started, wanted to say thank you for having us. Um, I'm going to go ahead here and share my screen and uh, also make sure that everyone's able to see it. All right. So um, as Sahil mentioned, we're going to talk about a topic today that we're uh, quite uh, interested in, which is open source test automation. Obviously, everyone here, I think, being the Selenium Conference, uh, is interested in one way or another in uh, open source test automation. So that's what we'll be talking about. Um, a little bit about myself, and I'll make this quick since I know we only have about uh, 15 minutes here. I'm the general manager for Test Project at a company called Tricentis. Uh, test Project was acquired by Tricentis in 2019. Uh, we are a free automation solution uh, that is provided to the community at no cost. It's built on top of Selenium and Appium. So if you're already using open source automation, um, I think you'll find it a nice tool to check out. So feel free to come by our booth and get a demo if you wanna see this uh, awesome free product. Um, I've been in the software testing market myself for about eight years, uh, and I really love open source testing. Um, it's something that I've been taking the lead on at Tricentis. I know Tricentis historically maybe wasn't thought of as a company that supported uh, the open source uh, initiatives in, in um, you know, meaningful way, but uh, we've certainly been doing a lot more of that recently. Uh, we acquired Test Project. We've also acquired open source load testing solutions um, around Flood IO. Um, we've also acquired a company called Specflow in the BDD space, and we did a uh, 2020 state of open source testing survey, which was one of the largest open source testing surveys ever. And we'll review a bit some of the results of that uh, here as we go through the presentation and talk through some of the challenges that companies uh, seem to be having today with open source. So you'll see here uh, a nice little graphic from our survey. Um, so one of the first questions that we asked in our survey, which is very relevant to this is, um, you know, how important is an open source functional testing tool? So that would be things like Selenium, Appium, et cetera, to uh, your functional testing process. And you'll see that um, between the people who said it was very important and important, you know, 92% of those people that we surveyed said essentially that they wanted or needed to have an open source tool for functional testing, which is why we say that open source is on fire. Um, but we found that, you know, open source isn't only for experts, right? We were really surprised to see um, that when we surveyed uh, the companies that, that were doing open source testing, you know, the average time that people had had um, being a tester was something about nine years uh, in the market. But um, you'll see that on either end here, we have huge experts that have, you know, 15 plus years in the space doing test automation. We also have uh, people just getting started with, you know, under five years in the field. So it's a really a wide mix between people who have been doing test automation their whole life and people who are just getting started. Um, one of the things that we wanted to dispel in our survey was that people are only using open source testing tools because they're free. Now, we did see that we asked people, you know, what do they enjoy about using open source testing tools? And uh, close to 40% of people did say that the cost was a major driver, a major factor in then ad them adopting the tools. Um, but a lot of other factors you know, came into play. And when you sum these up, they're much uh, larger than, than people who uh, commented about cost, right? So things like the community support, the integration to other tools, the ease of customization, uh, those become really big reasons for people to adopt open source tools and um, become things that people look for when they ad adopt an open source uh, automation solution. And so all, all in all, this is where we come today and you know, see the, the great uh, numbers that we have in this conference and in some of these other open source testing communities, 
you know, there's at least 500,000 people we know actively using open source testing tools. And that's just what we can see on LinkedIn. Um, I think the number might even be 5x that. So, you know, I'd be confident in saying there's millions of people using open source tools for testing. And that's, um, you know, a, a really easy thing to see why when you look at some of the numbers from the survey uh, that we conducted. But I would say uh, it's not without challenges, right? Uh, open source is great, but you know I think all test automation tools in general come with challenges and open source comes with a specific set of challenges. Uh, one would be we see that the technical skills required to create these tools are often very hard to come by. Um, two, we'll see that a lot of times these scripts that are built in open source tools might become very difficult to maintain. Uh, three, we see a lot of test automation teams becoming siloed and um, auto, you know, open source testing tools not really contributing to a lot of collaboration. Um, four, we see that a lot of times uh, people have really slow running test automation suites. Sometimes their test automation actually takes longer to run even than a manual test. And uh, five, we see that you know, there's a lot of lack of visibility into test results, a lot of fragmented test reporting, and um, inability to communicate the results of these open source testing tools up into uh, the management levels. Um, so I think let's start with the first one. You know, why do we see this challenge around lack of uh, you know, the right skills to create these, these tests um, in these open source automation tools? Uh, I think the number one thing is that, you know, the people who are creating these tests are oftentimes, you know, QA or testers and very rarely developers, right? We see a lot of people talking about, well, you know, developers should write all the tests. Sure, that sounds great. But in reality, it's really the testers writing the tests. And we see that um, oftentimes they don't have the right skills or they haven't been trained up. A lot of times these people might be uh, kind of migrating from more of a manual testing approach to an automated testing approach. And that's where we see, you know, that the training and skills become one of the biggest impediments to functional testing with open source testing tools based on our survey results. So what can you do about that? I think we recommend, you know, checking out recorders. There's a lot of great free recorders on the market. So no cost uh, to you, at least from a license perspective. Um, I think a lot of people are probably familiar with Catalan. There's obviously Selenium IDE, which has been really overhauled and relaunched in the last few years. Um, but there's also test projects. So feel free to come by our booth. You know, different strokes for different folks, I would say. But, um, you know, some of the differences, for example, if you're using Python um, or using C Sharp, um, you may find that test project is a better uh, recording solution for you because it allows you to export into those languages and continue to learn, you know, how to code on top of the recording that you've created with a scriptless recorder. So we we'll definitely check out these options. They're all um, compatible with Selenium, built on top of Selenium, sh so should be great tools as you kind of transition from a scriptless, you know, recording approach into more of a coding approach with Selenium. Now, we talked about test maintenance, um, and so this you know, picture here is kind of depicting what oftentimes being a test automation uh, expert looks like, right? You're just constantly playing whack-a-mole and, and breaking uh, tests that are you know, constantly failing for different reasons. Uh, a lot of times being that um, you know, a locator, for example, cannot be uh, found, an element can't be found when uh, running a particular test. This is a common thing. It might happen uh, unexpectedly when a developer, you know, changes, uh, let's say, the CSS uh, properties or, you know, the ID or things like that uh, related to a, a particular element on the page. And so we found that um, one approach that helps to solve this uh, common challenge and using open source tools like Selenium is adopting something like a page object model, right? This essentially abstracts uh, things from the page level and creates kind of a reusable model so that when things do inevitably change, it's easy to go to one place, update that locator and have a change across all of the tests that interact with that page. And so you'll see that the change is, you know, that uh, everything gets abstracted up from just being, you know, separate, you know, unorganized set of locators um, to something where, you know, we have pages and the pages have actions and the actions um, then map to these elements. So there's a bit of abstraction 
really can help with the test maintenance. Um, so this is something that's common in a lot of test frameworks. It also um, is built into a lot of the tools like uh, Test Project and Catalan that are the free tools built on top of Selenium as well. Um, another thing that can help with maintenance and just help with uh, reuse in general is uh, making sure that you build as many uh, kind of reusable tests as possible in as small of tests as possible, right? So if you can build things like, for example, a login that could be reused across a number of different tests, um, you can essentially nest these tests within one another. Um, this makes the process of kind of building out tests quickly uh, very easy, and it makes the maintenance process uh, simple as well, right? So, for example, if, you know, the URL to the site that you're testing happens to change, um, rather than having to go and find where that is in every single test, if you've used this same login process uh, consistently across every end-to-end -end test scenario, it will make it a lot easier to make those updates. And likewise, um, if you parameterize uh, and create variables for things like uh, the site URL or things like username and password, um, you can quickly reuse these tests in sort of negative testing scenarios like an unsuccessful login and also uh, have the same benefits, right, of not having to maintain these two separate sets of, of steps since they're essentially the same steps just with um, different uh, data or different variables. Um, so a lot of this has to do with um, taking a, a parameterized or test data-driven approach, right? So um, you can basically wire up um, these things like your URL, your username, your password in this example, and really pull those from a data source um, and define those as parameters. And then this way you can easily create a number of different scenarios to do you know, negative testing, test with different types of users, with different permissions, and things like that. Um, one thing that we do see a lot of people run into is as they start to automate their tests, their automated tests actually run more slowly than their manual tests. A lot of reason behind that is that they're not taking advantage of things like uh, parallelization, which is uh, essentially running uh, automated tests you know, in parallel. This is especially uh, a good approach when you're doing cross-browser testing, right, and you're running the same scenario across just multiple browsers, um, rather than running them in uh, series, right, where they run one after another. Um, one way to really speed up the uh, test automation process and get results more quickly is to actually run these tests in parallel um, using an approach where, you know, they can run in different threads at the same time. Um, a lot of companies uh, we're seeing, especially with our users and test project, are taking advantage of uh, browser and device farms to do this. Um, you know, basically these browser and device farms will host uh, machines and mobile devices for you that are ready at any time to run a test and then uh, execute these tests in parallel so that you can get, you know, much faster execution and results back to your developers. Um, we're seeing the most common ones that are being used in our customer base uh, as Sauce Labs and Browser Stack. Um, and then also a lot of companies are also building out their own Selenium grids, which is essentially a, uh, a test cloud or a, t a browser and device farm that they host themselves. Um, all of these solutions work great. I think it just comes down to, you know, what are your security needs? Uh, what type of budget do you have? And uh, also how much time do you have to maintain, you know, this infrastructure, right? You know, hosting your own Selenium grid can be a great option. Um, but it is obviously going to require maintenance from you when, um, you know, servers go down, when new browser, uh, you know, or operating system types come out. And, um, you know, it could be a good option uh, for companies, though, that need very high level of security. Uh, obviously, these solutions over here are run in the cloud and many companies um, you know, aren't yet ready to adopt uh, the idea of executing tests in the cloud. So a lot of different considerations to make here, but um, regardless of what your needs are, we definitely recommend where possible to uh, run parallel tests in, in a, um, a device or browser farm like one of these. Uh, finally, we do see that reporting is kind of a, a major gap in terms of test automation and success there. Um, you know, a lot of these tools will give you, you know, a, a kind of generic report, uh, which will show you just the pass and fail results of the various tests in your test suite. 
But you really want to have more than that. And uh, most importantly, you want to have one consolidated report that shows you results across all the different open source test automation tools you might be using. Um, so make sure you're measuring how fast your tests uh, run. So how quickly they're executing, you want to make sure that's always getting faster and not getting uh, slower because it's going to slow down your ability to get feedback to your developers. You want to measure flakiness, which is the predictability of the results um, from executing the tests, right? Are they consistent? Do the tests, you know, give you the right result? For example, when something works, does the test tell you that it passed or does it sometimes give you false positive and tell you that it failed? Um, coverage, you know, how many of your business functions are covered by automated tests? Novelty, um, this is comes down to uh, actually bugs and finding bugs. So this is where you might want your reports to be pulling uh, data from tools like Jira. You want to figure out how many new bugs are you finding, right? I think that's a lot of the value of test automation is catching and preventing new bugs rather than just finding the same old bugs that happen to uh, pop up, you know, sometimes when an environment's not properly configured or, you know, something that's uh, common continues to go wrong again. And then um, impact. I think this is a good one to tie back to the business is when you're doing your testing and you find that a function doesn't work, kind of go one level beyond that, right? It's uh, really crucial to know in the test report, you know, if, for example, the checkout process is not working and that means that when we go live, there's a risk that nobody's able to check out and the company collects no revenue. It's kind of an obvious example, right, where you would want to have some data about the impact as well uh, in your reports. So um, just to wrap up here, uh, you know, take a look at some of these um, recommendations we've got in terms of tools. Um, we definitely recommend, regardless of whether or not you want to use an open source tool or a commercial tool, you know, four basic things that you would want to consider would be a page object model, uh, you know, shared test and page element storage, um, ability to create tests scriptlessly so that you can support uh, kind of new and non-technical users, and uh, test parallelization, which oftentimes comes with uh, reporting. And so, you know, there's a number of different options um, like Selenium, Appium, obviously, TestNG, uh, you know, GitHub for storing your tests. You can store your tests on a uh, network storage device. Um, you could create your tests with Selenium IDE, things like Catalan, uh, run your tests on browser stack, Sauce Labs, a Selenium grid. Um, but also feel free to come by our booth and check out Test Project. Uh, we cover off, you know, a number of these areas as well and would love to uh, help you take your Selenium and your Appium testing as well to the next level. So uh, thanks for the time. I'm going to uh, go ahead and stop sharing my screen so that I can switch back here and uh, check out any questions while I was presenting. All right, so let's roll through here. We can probably open for questions now. Q and A. Uh, the only question I'm seeing here is about what about Combinatronics or Scenario Developer? Uh, if those are tools, I'm not familiar with those. Um, I would have to look those up, but. Uh, feel free to come by our booth. I'll be there uh, for the next uh, hour and a half or so. So I uh, would love to learn more about those tools. I think that was uh, Manohar that answered that question or asked that question. So I see a couple of questions in the audience uh, in the first tab, if you can uh, just glance through them. Oh, yeah, we're getting some more in the Q&A section now too. Oh, all right. Um, yeah. So. One question, is test project going to be open source forever? Um, yes, our SDK will be open source forever. And the product itself, since it's hosted in the cloud, is a free product. And we've made a free forever promise, um, which you can check out in more detail on our website. We'd also be happy to talk about that uh, at the booth. Um, question about if test project supports BDD. Um, yes, using our SDK, we have uh, a number of customers who are using uh, test project with frameworks like Cucumber uh, and SpecFlow. So we'd be happy to talk about that a bit more at the booth. 
And um, can you explain a little bit more on flakiness? So yeah, flakiness is the idea that when you run a test one time, it might pass, and then the next time it might fail, but nothing's actually changed in the application. It's a common thing that happens, you know, when elements and locators change, for example. Um, the way that Test Project gets around that is we actually have a self-healing capability uh, powered by AI. And that's brand new. We just uh, released that. So anyone who's interested in kind of building uh, less flaky tests, definitely say come by and check out a demo at our booth of the uh, free uh, self-healing in our new uh, recorder that we just released last week. That looks like it in the Q&A section. Um, let's see. Uh, can test project be implemented in company cloud or it has to be in your own cloud? Uh, it's in test project cloud for the moment. That's part of how we're able to deliver it for free. But we are um, exploring options where if people wanted to pay. They could um, deploy it in their own uh, environment, but we haven't figured that out yet. Um, let's see. Uh, what happened to Protractor? Is it dead? Um, I don't know if it's dead, but I think um, Cypress is becoming a tool that's becoming very popular uh, in replacing Protractor for people that are testing uh, JavaScript front-end frameworks like uh, React and, and things like that. Um, Apart from TestNG, is and there any other tool that helps in parallel execution? I think Selenium Grid uh, is the main one that we're seeing uh, in terms of you know helping people with on-premise parallel execution. Um, yeah, do you see keyword testing as being reliable? I think we do. Um, that's something we'd love to show you if you want to come by our booth. And uh, how much priority should be given to UI testing and API testing? I would say that's a tough question. It kind of depends on, you know, your skill set, what your app does, and, um, you know, uh, kind of how it's architected as well. Um, I know we're a couple minutes over. I see a lot more questions coming through. Um, Sahil, do we want to keep going with answering these, or can I answer these uh, in the chat as we go on? Yeah, I think uh, we can probably, yeah, that's what, uh, we can direct all the other questions in the booth, if that's okay. Yes, uh, if we can somehow just send those yeah. over there, I'm happy to go over to the booth and we can start answering yeah. those. Yeah, so uh, just to conclude, uh, first of all, thank you, Kevin, for sharing your experience with us. Uh, and for everyone, the, Kevin would be in uh, the sponsor booth, so if you want to catch him for further queries he'll, he'll be happy to help and of course again a big, uh, big shout out to test project uh, basically they for sponsoring this talk itself uh, and again there are like uh, more than 1000 people from more than 40 countries in this event right now so that's that's actually a great opportunity to network so I'll encourage everyone to uh, go into lobby VIP lounges to actually, you know, find find the speakers and uh, ask them, and not just speakers, other attendees, uh, just to uh, find out what's going on. And yeah, uh, thanks all for uh, attending this session. Uh, there are slides, handouts that are already uploaded uh, to the session. You can grab them. Uh, and yeah, have a great evening and great rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.